So uh, my name is William Harry Chow. I'm a assistant professor from the Ohio State University. And today I'm going to talk about how can we learn to perceive with um, some kind of very important semantic cue in raw data. Okay. So I, I believe that everyone here are interested in auto driving or are very expert in auto driving. And the goal really is that you want to let a car to be able to decide its action automatically to drive from one place to the other. And in order to do that safely, well, we need to process a lot of sensor signal, go from LiDAR camera and many others, such that you can perceive the environment, knowing where the objects are, how will those traffic participants move, and finally, you can decide the actions. And for, for me, uh, I mainly work on the perception part. And today, I will mainly just focus on uh, per perception using uh, LiDAR signal. Okay, so just, I mean, well, this is what we would really want for 3D perception, right? Very much you have sensor signal coming in like LiDAR signal or maybe camera, and you want the model, the precision model or detection model to output very accurate position of all the traffic participants, right? This is the goal we want to achieve, right? However, um, doing so have several challenges and it's long time challenges. And the first really, well, labeling data, give me a second. Yeah, the first change you really, well, labeling data is pretty tedious. So I play in the videos here, like if you want to label just a thing with like maybe like 10 cars, 10 pedestrians, you can see that even labeling one object maybe take you 10, 15 seconds, not to mention the whole thing. Right? So it will take a lot of time to label data. And you may say, okay, we just label it once, that's it, right? What's the matter? But we also know that at the same time from the hardware, people are advancing different sensors, right? So for example, left-hand side is the sensor that everyone probably are very familiar with, like those 360 LiDAR, but they are also frontal view LiDAR, right? And then their point patterns are very different, which means well, when you go from one sensor to the other, you may need to relabel data again so as to train uh, 3D perception systems. Okay, so... Even though you, you do have very good data, um, maybe after you train a model, there are still challenges inherently in 3D perception. So I'm playing a, I mean, a little old algorithm here, like four years old, but it's still very public algorithm point RCNN. So we train it, we apply it to the environments. And I play with several bounding bus here. The green one are the ground truth and the yellow one are the detection. So you can see that there, a lot of false positive, especially for far away objects, lots of false positive and some false negative for very small objects. So what are really the reasons there? The reason is because for far away or small objects, um, their points are usually very sparse. And not to mention when you have domain shift, for example, you train your model from one environment apply to the other. Well, for far away objects, your accuracy will drop severely. So these are inherent changes for 3D perception. Let me play with one example. So left hand side is a whole point cloud and I specifically zoom in to a particular position. And I play, I place a green box there. So my question is that to you, is that a car traffic participant or not, right? So if from a single LiDAR scan, it's probably a little bit hard to tell, right? But if we, really take a look, well, it's actually not a car. It's just a steady sign, right? However, if from LiDAR, we can see if you just found one single LiDAR scan, there's inherent, inherent ambiguity there. So this is why, I mean, 3D precision is challenging. Okay, so just to summarize, what are the changes that we try to solve first? Well, labeling 3D data for training, 3D perception, detection algorithm, take lots of time. And second, even you can train a model, 3D perception itself is challenging, especially for small, far away, ambiguous objects. Okay. So in my today's talk, what I want to do is really, how can we acquire more semantic cues, for example, in training to reduce the labeling effort or in testing to help us solve those very challenging, far away, ambiguous object cases, okay. So in this talk, um, I will particularly focus on um, several free semantic cues that in the raw data we can use 
to lower down the labeling effort and to help us uh, predict, to help us detect objects even better. So in my first part, we'll talk about algorithm that we recently come up with is that to pre-trim by colorization. Okay, that is if I give you point clouds and if I can learn to colorize, we find out this is a very strong pre-training objective function to help us pre-train the 3D object detectors. And at part two, I will then dive into another topic called learning with repetition. That is, we all drive, most of us all drive every day through repeated traversals, right? And usually you just, you collect data today, you just throw it away. You, you only use the data today to perceive the environment right away. But actually we find out if you can collect data over days uh, along your repeated traversals, it can really help you to make the prediction for tomorrow better. Okay. And anytime if you have a question, please let me know. Okay. So now I will focus on the first part that is how can we pre trim a 3D object detector by colorization? So just a recap well, okay, for most of the 3D object detectors, you take a lighter point cloud coming in. Well, you will develop an object detector, which usually, comes, usually is composed of two parts a feature backbone to extract features from LiDAR points and a detection pad on the top to output bounding box. And many algorithms can fall into this category, right? If you look at point RCN, if you look at very famous PV RCN, they all have this feature backbone and a detection head on the top. Okay. So in all, but again, training this model will require lots of label data, right? So you may ask, okay, because there is a feature backbone, can we pre-train, can we do pre-training, unsupervised pre-training, self-supervised pre-training with unlabeled data, which are much easier to call, like can we pre-train our uh, feature backbone, right? To reduce the labeling after, efforts. And the answer is of course, yes, because, and there are already a lots of existing work for pre-training 3D object detectors using unlabeled data. And we can, I just list like four algorithms here. And there are many. However, if we look, if we dive into their uh, core techniques, they, most of them are based on contrasted learning. That is, they are going to define a positive pair of point cloud or sub point clouds and a negative pair and try to force the model to predict a positive pair closer and far away to negative pairs. So if we dive into the detail, we see a lots of uh, difference in how to define a positive pair and negative pair, but the high level idea is very much the same, okay? So when my my student and I look into how to pre-training, we try to think about, can we go outside this paradigm? Is there any other way we can use, any other fundamental idea we can use for pre-training? So we really, now we really come back to the object detection pipeline. We re-ask, what do we really need from pre-training, okay? So we think because our ultimate goal is to go from LiDAR point cloud, Right? It's a list of points to output a list of object bounding bugs. So we really think a good pre-training for 3D object detection is to really bridge these two information, right? How to go from point cloud to bounding boxes. Okay. And it's not quite explicit. However, we think if we can help the backbone, if we can help the backbone to output features which can be used to cluster points, okay, into object or parts. Then it's make the whole pipeline easier because if if the backbone, the output feature can be used to cluster, then we have multiple cluster. We just need to read out the extent or the coordinates of each point cluster. We can know the bounding box. Okay, so this is our ideas. Okay, we try to really bridge these two information. We try to. Um, equip the feature backbone with the ability to cluster points. Okay, so of course there, there have been several, well, clustering algorithm in point cloud alone, but usually they will lack semantic uh, information. So what we really want to do is that, how can we use color information, okay, to guide the feature backbone for point cloud to segment points. So we know that in, Normal no uh, auto driving car, even that data collection, you will collect LiDAR data and camera together. Even in inference time, you don't use camera. Well, 
most of the data set have LiDAR camera together, right? And then they are aligned, which means you can project the LiDAR point cloud to image and every LiDAR point, if it's in the field of view, where you can have associated color, right? And why we want to use the color information to guide the backbone to do clustering, because we know that color in, in the color space, each object or object part usually possess a coherent color, right? And they also have sharp color contrast to the background, right? For example, if you look at image segmentation algorithm, just by using region growing super pixel, you can already got quite decent segmentation of objects or part, which means color information really provide a semantic cues for you to segment object out, okay, from each other in front of background. So our hypothesis is that even though the 3D object detector itself will only use LiDAR point cloud as input. However, if in during pre-training, if we can learn to colorize the LiDAR point cloud, then we will let the feature backbone equip with the semantic cues to segment object and to facilitate the downstream object detection. Okay, so our goal is really to use colorization as a pre-training objective. Okay, so it's at this moment it's a kind of we go uh, around, but that final it's kind of pretty simple ideas. However, to make this idea work, that is to car use colorization for pre-training, there are still some inherent challenge, right? And the first challenge is really you want to do colorization. Well, you want to go from point cloud to predict color. However, if I just ask you, I mean, what should the color of this object be, right? I, I guess there may be over 10, 20 answers there, right? Because this is just a point cloud. It's a car model, but we know the same point cloud, same car model can have many different colors, right? Not to mention other background, okay? Or other or pedestrian, like we all, we all work differently, right? There are different color you can you can use to colorize a point cloud. Which means if we just learn, naively learn to colorize, if we just naively learn to colorize, like supervised learning to colorize, because there are too many options in your data set, the model will inevitably learn to predict the average color. And the average color usually don't have very strong contrast. So let me say I show you a true, the true color Okay, of an environment, a specific environment. And the right hand side, if we, if we just learn to colorize, you see the color very much become average color. Like all the cars become a blue one, right? Even though at left hand side, you see the car can have gray color, white color, but when you predict, it's just average color, right? And by predicting average color, you really lose the contrast, okay, information from the images. And we find out this is really the core problem, why learning to colorize may not work so well as a pre-training objective, because there are inherent ambiguity, inherent variation. And if I can dive deeper, a little like math, math definition of what is what this issue really is, let's use X to represent a point cloud and Y to represent its corresponding color, right? So when I say color variation, that is, I give you a point cloud, there's a large entropy of what the corresponding Y should be. And when you have a large entropy, that also means you have very small mutual information between your input point cloud and the output color to learn, which means when you have very huge variation, there is nothing your backbone model can learn because there is no mutual information inside your data. Okay, And so you may ask, okay, if it's variation, why not we come up with maybe a better colorization algorithm, right? The data is noisy to just do a better algorithm. And so my question to everyone is that, well, can, can we resolve this variation problem really by having a better algorithm? And the answer is no. And sorry about this. And the answer is no, because this variation, if everyone still remember the very legendary like bias variant decomposition, right? When you learn machine learning course, 101, there's a bias variant versus decomposition, there's a noise turn. And the noise turn can never be reduced by having better algorithm. Right? You hear people talk about, hey, I can reduce the bias, reduce the variance, but this variation corresponds to a noise turn. You can never reduce it by having a better algorithm. The only way we can do 
is to change the way we use the data, is to change the way that we have point cloud, we have color, is to change the way how we use this information, okay? So based on this idea that we cannot develop better algorithm, we need to change the way to use data. So in colorization, we come up with a new way. So instead of directly give point cloud, we learn to colorize. Okay, instead of doing this, because doing this, there's a huge entropy that you cannot learn. You can, your model really cannot learn any information from this data. What we want to do is that, why not during colorization, we first provide some hints. Okay, we first provide some hints to the point cloud say, hey, well, this car may be blue. Well, this position may be black. The other position may be purple. By providing this, we first providing this as hints and then we do colorization. Okay. And why this matter? Because first, we know the environment have different color variation. But if I provide some hints to say, hey, this car, this position may be blue, that position may be another color. This hint actually ground the correlation process to the content to reduce the, the variation. And also by doing this, if we provide extra evidence, the entropy will lower down, right? Because we provide extra evidence of the between color and between point cloud, at the entropy will go down. And at the same time, the mutual information will enlarge, which means there are more information your object detection backbone can learn. So just now let's put everything together to see how we really can uh, pre-train in by colorization. So given point cloud, okay, what we are going to do is that we go, this point cloud will go to a backbone. You will get the features and we follow loss of generality that assume every point will get a feature, right? This is just normal feature backbone output features, okay? So we have M point, each point will have features. So how can we provide hints? What we do is that we concave these points with color information. And I will only provide some of the points. So you can see every point I will concave with color, but some of those is very much empty, which means I don't provide a color, but some of the point I provide a color. So now I concave this feature together. And then I then go through a color decoder to predict the color of those remaining points. So I provide true color for some of the points and as the model to predict the remaining points color, which means the overall pre-training objective, instead of doing contrary learning, which usually requires some detailed tuning, this pre-training is nothing but a point-wise color regression problem. So what we do is that we have point feature, we, for some of them, we provide a true color and we want the model, the decoder to predict the remaining color, okay? And why this is helpful for object detection, because in order to do this characterization well, the model must, and the, the output feature must know which points actually belong to the same objects. So then the decoder can propagate the color to the nearby points. So by doing this, we hypothesize, hypothesize that the output embedding by the backbone should tell which point should be segmented together or colored together. Okay. So now, you can see that after pre-training, what we can do is that we just drop every other component, okay? And we drop every other component. So now, during fine tuning with label data, now you don't see color, but the playbook have already equipped some information from the color guidance, and then we can then just fine tune this model for 3D object detection. Okay, so the overall, final overall model, there's no color information, but our pre-training by injecting a hint in the middle guide a model, guide a model for pre-training using color information. Okay. So just put everything together. The red part is pre-training and the blue part is fine tuning. Okay. So before I dive into um, external result, let's just do a final check. What, how, what really this algorithm learned? Okay, so I give you a point cloud again. I just randomly put several colors. Okay, this color, another true color of the point cloud and we just run our algorithm, you will see that our algorithm can really identify which point should belong to the same object and propagate this color out, even though this color are not the original color of the point cloud, okay? Which means eventually, while I say we do retraining by colorization, 
we don't really want to predict the exact color. We only want to predict which points should be segmented and colored together. Because if we can do this, we, we can equip the model, the backbone knowing, oh, where are the objects? And later on, they just need to predict a bounding box for each object. Okay. So let's look at some of these results. Uh, we tried several uh, object detectors. The first is point RCN. And the setting is we pressure on Wemo, on supervised pressure on Wemo, and fine tune with supervised data on Kitty. So we fine tune with 20%, 50%. And the green one is trend from scratch. For example, trend from 20% data from scratch or 50%. The yellow one is trend from the all the entire kitty data. So you can see that trend from partial data, the performance really is lower. And with our method pre-training, we can hugely improve the performance. Especially for pedestrian, we can even outperform just trend from scratch, uh, trend with full data from kitty. And so our, again, as I mentioned, our algorithm is quite straightforward, it's just a regression problem, but it can already be as good as state-of-the-art control learning algorithm for pre-training. Okay. And we also try our algorithm on other algorithms like PVRCN. Even PVRCN doesn't have a point-wise feature, they have a voxelized feature. Our algorithm can, be, can still be applied to achieve decent improvement compared to the state-of-the-art. And they just also see some more quantitative result. And again, this is the true color. If we just do colorization, directly you will just predict the average color, which doesn't really help the backbone. For us, what do we do is that we provide some hints. And so the model will realize, oh, how to propagate this color well, to other points and be up to aware. So you can see what our method is trying to do is providing some seed point and as a model to propagate out to colorize the whole scene. And does this really help? And the answer is yes. So this is another comparison. The green one is trend from scratch, 5% data. The blue one is colorization, but without providing hints. And the red one is colorization, but with providing hint during pre-training. We can see this mechanism of providing hint really boosts the performance to make Colorization, a simple adjective function for pre-training to be as good as state-of-the-art country learning objective. Okay, so this is my first part of the presentation. And then uh, for the sake of time, I will move on to the second part. And so for the first part, what we do is we propose a simple pre-training algorithm, colorization, like just a straightforward regression object related country learning. So it bypass country learning, but it can achieve kind of like state-of-the-art performance for pre-training. And for my second part, I will then dive into another information. So the first part is using color as a semantic cue to pre-train object detail. The second one is a different semantic cues by keep the data you drive every day. Okay, use the data yesterday, a week ago, to add the prediction for tomorrow, or even help you detect, learn object detail without label data. Okay, so to begin with, why this is practical? Because really, for us, when we drive, usually you drive through repeat location, right? You drive to shopping, you drive to work, commute, recreational activities. We we most of the time we drive through repeated routes, right? But unfortunately, most of the time what you collect data only for the perception at a specific moment you, and you drop it. But later I'm going to show that this information from yesterday, from several past days really are helpful for perception. And by the way, you just collect data, they're unlabeled, but they can be quite useful, okay? So just one example, right? Previously I mentioned this point cloud. I asked you, hey, is that a, a traffic participant like a vehicle or not, right? By looking at this, it's probably a little bit, a little ambiguous. But if I can see data from several days ago, if I always see, hey, that object is always there, right? Then you get the impression, well, this is probably a static object because it never moved, right? So by using this idea, if I can see data from the previous days, if I can compare my current perception data to previous day's data, it provides you another semantic cues to tell is that a traffic participant or is a background, okay? 
So I'm going to talk about multiple examples of how can we use this past traversal to help perception. Okay. The first one is, can we use this to learn an object detector for mobile object for like cars, pedestrian, uh, cyclists? Okay, can we use this data to learn object detectors without any label data? Okay, so for humans, very straightforward. If I just give you this point cloud, you will tell you can easily say, hey, there are two cars, right? But the, in the beginning, the model doesn't know that. Okay. However, if I really can have data from different days, so this is not consecutive time, this is different days, but at the same location. Okay. If I can have data from past several days, and I can then do the following. Okay, I want to know does this point belong to a traffic participant or not? What I can do is I just go back to the previous day. I want to see if I, I see myself from the past days, right? If I or if I have a neighbor from the past days, right? And so I then I can get together these neighbor points and I can do a histogram to see how many neighbor I find out from each days. So you can imagine if the points I pick, the Q point, if the points from the background, then you probably will see the same number of neighbor every day, right? So this histogram will be pretty kind of uniform. You have a high entropy. However, if that point actually belongs to a traffic participant, then at the sum of the day, you see it, some of the you don't. It will have a very, uh, it will have low entropy. So by calculating entropy, we can already colorize our point clouds with very good information, like which one is foreground, which one is background, okay? So just give you another example, like I have a traversals, and by using traversal, and I compare the current point cloud to previous traversal, I can already give very good colorization to, to say which part is foreground, which part is background, okay? So then we then use this information to really prepare label data for training object detector, okay? So this is what we do. Give me a second. So now, as I said, right, a point cloud when compared to previous history, I can have this information where likely to be foreground, where likely to be background. So we can use this information to prepare training data for 3D object detection. We can simply do clustering. We can then feed in bounding box. We can remove some, well, unreasonable bounding box like box flying or box below the ground. And now we can get that bounding box. And if you compare this one to the very right hand side, what you already see there, the bounding box we obtain without any label data are already very good compared to ground truth bounding box. Okay. And you may say, okay, this is not perfect because you may still miss several objects. You may have incorrect bounding box. Okay. But we also find out, well, if you just do some very simple idea called self training, you get the initial label, you train on this label, you predict and use a predict label as a new training data. We can see that by doing multiple rounds of self-training and we can improve the bounding box to be as good as ground truth. Okay, so overall the idea is that we use multiple traversal <laughs> and use the idea that, well, traffic participant will well, they will not stay at the same location every day. We use the information to identify candidate object, and we we use self-training to fully improve the prediction or the bounding box. Okay, so we can see the result here. So if we do this idea, like we do self-training multiple rounds, we can already learn a very good object detector for all the for all the uh, mobile object with a very high accuracy on a leap data set. Why we use leaf? Because the leaf data set do have traversal repetition. In the data set, every location you probably will see four to six times. And we compare these two, if we train a model from Kitty and adapt to lift, we can see that in some of the cases, especially far away, the algorithm we develop just learn object detector from unlabeled data can already outperform supervised learning from a different, in, from a different domain. And the final deeper gray one is the supervised learning from the data set. And as you can see, well, the result we have is not too far away from training with supervised data, okay. And the gap here for those lies 
great. It really means if we, our algorithm training purely for unlabeled data can outperform supervised learning from a different domain. Okay, this is the first example we can use traversal to learn object detector without labeled data. And beside learning, we can also use past traversal to add your current perception. Okay, for example, now I'm driving a car. This is the LiDAR scan I see. I, I need to use this for prediction. But if I actually have yesterday's data, I can pre-track yesterday's features. Okay, and I can aggregate them as a external information to guide my current prediction. Okay, so in our iClear paper last year, we kind of developed an algorithm that we combine these two information. Yesterday's data or like past data, we concave them with the current data by an algorithm we developed, which is very efficient. Then we can really, so here I just showed decorate. Decorate color means we now provide extra information to the point cloud. And then this point cloud, when we use to make prediction, it can be even more accurate because we combine the current information and the previous information for better prediction. Just some quick results. So the deep green one means we just use the current input data to make prediction. The light green one means we combine yesterday data, we call it hindsight. We combine yesterday data to make prediction. We can see a decent improvements. And you may ask, will they be very slow? And the answer is no, because the yesterday feature can be pre-computed. So for the current time, we only need to retrieve their information. And because we already pre-compute and save the data in a sparse data structure. So the extra data you need to save for yesterday is actually not that heavy. Okay. And here are just some result. Left hand side, again, green is ground truth, yellow is prediction. If we just use current First, uh, input data to make prediction, we have a lots of false positive. But if we come by yesterday, yesterday's data, we improve, we remove those false positive. And another, re, another result here, we, we remove the false positive and even detect the false negative, uh, very small objects. Okay. And there are some other extension. We can also use this idea to do domain dotation. If I have a model trend from another country, I want to adapt to a different places. I can also in the in the new places collect traversal and use the traversal to improve domain rotation. And there are some other examples. For example, if I have multiple cars, some of them those have light or some of those have camera, we also develop algorithm that those mod those algorithm only those auto driving car only based on camera can leverage LiDAR information from other cars. And if you want to explore more, we also collect a data called Isaka 365, which we collect data along the Cornell campus uh, for at least 40 traversal and across different weather conditions. So you can study this using past traversal uh, more broadly, right? And just to give you one example of what we do, and I believe many of many of you know like style transfer image to image translation. Most of the time people do un unpair because it's so hard to get paired data. But because our data is multiple traversal, so you actually have like coarsely aligned pair data, right? So you can use this data to learn image to image translation algorithm. So right hand side is what we can get. The middle one is just unpaired image translation. So you can see right hand side we can preserve the layout way much better than the middle one, which is trend with unpaired data. Okay. So I go a little over time, but to summarize, um, today I really want to solve labeling issue and the inherent change in perception. And what I want to do is how to acquire extra semantic cues to improve, to lower down the training data preparation costs and improve the testing phase. So we talk about pre-training by characterization, which is a simple pre-training algorithm, uh, which can achieve state-of-the-art results. And we also talk about how can we le leverage the repetition past data to help us learn object detector without label data, to help us add your current perception, even for domain rotation. And we have a new data set, which has been there, which have 40 traversals through the same route, but different weather, which can open up many exciting future research. So finally, I want to do this thanks to my old 
colleagues, without them, this work won't be possible. And thank you so much for listening. Yeah. So for uh, one or two questions now, there is one question. Okay. Yeah, let me see if I, is there? Yeah, so the, the self training objective, what we do is that we make prediction. So we have, so just to, uh, oh, okay, just to, um, Say the question again. So, what is the self training objective? That is, when we use that, when we create kind of pseudo labels, what we do is that initially we have some labels. We use those labels to train our object detectors. And then what we do is that we just keep those high confidence prediction as the next round pseudo label. And we just keep training on that. So, it's every time we train, we have C labels, we train from them, we make prediction, keep the high confidence prediction as pseudo ground truth bounding box. And we then return our model on that and make prediction again, keep the high confidence bounding box and treat them as pseudo, lab, treat them as pseudo ground truth and train up to detection again. Yeah. Hopefully this uh, answer your question. Uh, do we have one question from the audience here? Go ahead, please. Uh, so I want to ask, uh, uh, I think one Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. That's a good point. Yeah. So, oh yeah, the the question is that instead of just using color, can we use tracking information from for from the image to to help us pre-train through the object detect detector? And I think the, the answer is yes, definitely. So what we what I want to bring up is that well, there are rich semantic cues right in in the raw data. So instead of really you need to label it, and um, if we can dive deeper into the raw data, some kind of underlying regularity in the raw data. If we use that wisely, we can pre-train precision algorithm for 3D object detect for 3D environment uh, much data efficiently. Yeah. Great, let's thank the speaker yeah. again. Yeah, thank you.